Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, back to day 63 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. I think I got the slogan right again. Um, so today, um, last time, we, we ended after a monstrous stream of, I think it ended up being four and a half hours almost. Uh, I, I had to run off in a huff uh, for, for someone showing up uh, to fix the internet. Um, but uh, I finished, uh, I, I got the bug fix that was sort of lingering at the end of that stream, and I massively refactored and cleaned up that code. So we're going to look at that in a second. Um, other than that, um, there's been a bunch of other kind of compiler work uh, over the last few days, sort of some, some, some new minor features. Um, and so I want to go over those briefly as well. And then I want to go back into doing more data structures, um, because if you recall, kind of the, even though this work we're doing is something that needs to be done for the standard library, I'm kind of explicitly focusing on more on the critical path of stuff we need in order to do a good, solid, idiomatic implementation of the kind of uh, the, the kind of things we were using all the time for uh, for the uh, for the ion compiler in C. And so right now we have stretchy buffs and maps. In fact, we've got sets sort of as a side benefit. Uh, we don't have uh, intern maps like uh, name maps, which are built on top of those primitives, but need some additional. Uh, that needs some additional customization because you're dealing with strings, which are variable length zero term variable length data basically. Um, whereas currently our data structure uh, works with fixed length data, like structs, you know, structs with fixed size, static arrays of fixed size, but not um, variable size data like strings. So we're going to do that after doing the code review. So um, let's dive into that. So yeah, uh, this is where we left off. Um, I can't honestly remember all the changes I made, so I'm just going to talk about the stuff that sort of is topmost in my mind, um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go over some questions that I heard repeatedly from folks off stream uh, since to, to, to clarify, um, I, I guess, what must be recurring uh, questions. So um, let's see here. Uh, first off, in my original code, there was a bunch of confusion about the notion of the number of occupied slots versus the length of the underlying data you're indexing. So that was just like a source of bugs that I noticed. Uh, I had just done a brain fart when I was thinking through that. So that's now all much cleaner. Um, I think where we left off and where we were trying to fix stuff was actually in the rehashing. But first off, I mean, I don't blame you if you don't have photographic memory and can't remember what these functions look like, but these functions got massively more elegant, like very compact and, and unified, very little redundancy between them. Um, so all these functions, basically, there's the get slot function, and then there's some, you know, operation specific uh, use of that, and then there's a put slot function, which is, um, I guess, used. No, it's not even used here. Um, used internally for rehashing. So the basic idea, I think, I think where we were basically last time is that you know when you put something in the hash table, um, when you uh, then uh, you fill in a new slot, you increment your occupied counter, and if you reach your max threshold, you have to go and rehash. So we were doing the rehashing. Uh, the new rehashing is extremely is extremely simple compared to before, and let me just go over it. This is the rehasher now. So all we're doing is we're initializing a new index, um, and so this is a unified init function, and you can see here we're just, we're not allocating anything, like the hash index itself uh, is on the stack. Um, and then what we're doing is we're going over the existing slots and for each of them, if it's, uh, this is just a, a smart ass way of writing, be, be, because delete, the deleted and empty sentinels are at the top of the value range, they're the, the largest possible value and the largest possible value minus one. Um, this is just a way of saying, if you're neither deleted nor empty, then we transfer the slot to the new rehash table. And so after going through this, uh, we free the old slots and we copy over the index in place and we're done. So all the actual work happens in this function, which as you'll see in a sec, is very simple. Um, and you can see one very nice feature of this is if you, if you notice, we're not passing in the original array, we're rehashing. Because we're caching our hash values, we actually don't need to consult the original array when doing rehashing. And that's actually very important because while this array is nice and tightly packed, uh, the original array could have huge values, right? Like it's po it's possible the data we're indexing has like very large stride and that the order we would have to index that data in would be fairly random access. So um, aside from just coalescing the data, this access pattern we get from this is much more coherent um, spatially than what we would get from having to go and basically rehash the data 
which would, I mean, it would be more expensive just in the virtue of the fact that we have to rehash it, but the fact that we have to touch that memory at all uh, incoherently would be massively more expensive than what we're doing. So this is now very, very simple. Um, and so the put slot function um, essentially just it takes a hash slot, which is, you know, is just a pair consisting of uh, an index uh, and a hash value. And, uh, and you can see we, um, we, we create the start index and then we do an infinite loop until we find an empty slot to put it in and then we put it there and we increment the occupied counter and that's it. Um, and we don't need to do any rehash checking here because put slot is only used by rehashing. And so the, 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 the precondition is that, um, you know, there's, it, it's always going to be large enough that you don't have to check basically. Like you're, you're enlarging the table so that there's certainly there's certainly more than one hash empty marker in the table. In fact, there's going to be something like 25% at a minimum. Um, and so you don't actually have to, you know, you, you kind of make it large enough in advance that you don't have to do recursive re rehashing or anything stupid like that. So that's basically the new code. And other than that, there's just a lot of cleanup. Um, and uh, the other thing I did, which uh, is that rather than calling these, uh, you know, vtable style functions directly in the code, I put inline front ends on top of it. So first off, it eases the calling convention because you don't have to sort of repeat index. Dot, uh, you don't have to write some of these things repeatedly. You just pass in the index and the arguments and it sort of does the thing itself. Uh, the other nice, sort of the, the, the general reason you should do this is not just in order to hide the de internal details of how the dispatch is done, although that is very important because you shouldn't make the dispatch be an external feature if at all possible. Uh, the dispatch mechanism is only really relevant to index implementers. Uh, it's not relevant to index clients. And so you should, you should abstract that away for two reasons. First is you can provide a nicer interface to clients. But second, and maybe more importantly, if you're a systems programmer, this makes it very easy to optimize this later so that you can change the dispatch mechanism. So in other words, we're not committing to vtables. And even if we do end up using vtables for open-ended extensibility, it's very easy to have a fast, a fast path, path dispatch where we do something like if indexer is a hash indexer, then we just call hash get directly. Otherwise, we go through the vtable. Uh, and, and by doing this, if, if hash indexer, uh, you know, if, if this is a static ha uh, this is a static pointer value, um, this is comparing against a constant, and because this is a known call target, it can even it can do inlining, shallow inlining, deep inlining, it can do all kinds of stuff, basically that you'd be able to do without a v table, um, but you still have the v table as the source of truth. This is just a way of optimizing it after the fact, and that really requires that you have this unified front end um, that. Um, that every, everyone has to go through. Otherwise, you're coupling to potentially really bad decisions about dispatch, uh, dispatch mechanism and data representation for, um, for your uh, indexers. So that's just a general note on, on some things you should do. So don't be scared of vtables necessarily. Uh, it's a convenient way of organizing different code without having to use switch statements and enums everywhere. But if it turns out that uh, you end up with a set of three things and you just want to do a switch, you can do that later. There's no reason to do that now. Just wait, right? Like, just make sure, you know, when people talk about premature optimization, the important thing is you have to prematurely see into the future and, and have an idea about where uh, coupling will occur that will make optimization impo impossible and then prevent that. But you don't have to commit to, uh, to, 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 to leaf level uh, premature optimization, basically. But, but this requires some experience in seeing what, 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 commitments are final versus just kind of temporary and transient can be changed later with, with no cost. All right, so enough about that. But I saw people ask about uh, dispatch and vtables, and I think some people who uh, associated with all the, the ills of OO don't realize that um, at the end of the day, this is just a way of organizing dispatch, and you can reorganize it if you don't overly couple to the internals. All right. Um, let me just flip through this and see what else pops out, and then I'll cover some other changes. Um, there's some, there's mostly minor changes to report elsewhere, but um, I do want to report them. All right. Um, so yeah, if you recall, let's go and look at the test code. Um, boom, 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 boom. That should still all work. So I guess you haven't seen the new code working. Um, 
since we were still, but yeah, so, so all this stuff works now uh, with the hash table. Um, right now, the way you ask for hashing is to actually set the hash index explicitly. This is just because I'm testing. Uh, clearly what's going to happen long term is that you always start out with a default indexer, which is just linear search. Uh, but probably what you should do is as soon as someone puts a key in a table or more than n keys, where n is say 16 or some low number, you switch from the default indexer, which does linear uh, uh, linear search, but with no auxiliary data structure, so it's very space efficient and very uh, CPU efficient. You switch to a hash table automatically after putting a certain number of keys in your uh, on top uh, in your linear index, and then you just switch it in place or something like that. But right now, I'm just doing it explicitly because I'm testing it. But um, I don't want you to think that this kind of approach commits you to always having to overly be overly specific about what kind of index you want. That's obviously user hostile. You want to have um, some good defaults. Um, like I said, uh, don't use a hash table for less than 16 and switch to a hash table for a certain size. And in fact, I mentioned last time as well, even though we're not doing this in our current hash implementation, but the other thing you want to do is you want to actually change the representation of the hash table a little bit when you move between sort of different size classes. Like when you go between, uh, you know, when you go from six in the range from 16 to 256, you want to use uh, one byte indices from 256 to 64K, 16-bit. Uh, from 64K to 4 gigabytes, you want to use 32 bits. And hopefully don't have uh, more than uh, four, 4 billion entries in your hash table. Uh, but even then, you could move to 64 bit uh, without uh, weighing down the, the space and runtime cost of the lower end tables. It's, it, using this mechanism, it's very easy to, uh, w w without too much du code duplication or, or nastiness, it's very easy to do that sort of adaptive change of representation. You don't have to find a single unified representation that uh, trades off everything against each other. So anyway, uh, but, but yeah, right now we do that explicitly just because we're testing. Uh, but of course, I mean, the great thing about this is that it still works without that. Um, and then it just uses the linear index, uh, which is just linear search. No no actual index per se, just linear search. Um, all right. Uh, language features. There's been, there's been a few changes since last time. Some of it was just compiler internals. Uh, it ended up being necessary for other features. But I reworked the way incomplete array works. So... Um, Incomplete arrays, the way I ended up implementing it originally was a little bit ad hoc. Excuse me, I just got something in my throat. So basically, you know, in C, the main case where you see incomplete arrays like this is you actually don't want to have an incomplete array. You want to have an, a complete array, but you want it to infer the length of the array. So you don't want to have to write three or even a macro because that's sort of higher maintenance to maintain if you add or remove entries later. So you want to be able to do this. This is not really an incomplete array. It's like syntactically incomplete in the sense that there's no specification of the size. But um, as soon as you, you know, it's statically known what the size is, right? It's not like a dynamic array or anything crazy. Um, so, so that's sort of syntactically incomplete, but semantically complete. Um, and then you have things that are actually semantically incomplete. Like if you just write something like this. Um, and previously I was treating all of those as basically having zero elements and then I would just have sort of a hack for detecting uh, the the case like this and replacing the type with a, in, with a complete array type or something like that. So it turned out that had all kinds of issues. I, I fixed up the internals of that. We don't necessarily need to go into the details of it, but just wanted to mention it uh, in case you see issues uh, with that. Uh, then please report it. Um, but um, all right, that's bird two changes. Someone had a very good idea, and it also echoed ideas that I saw early on uh, when I first introduced uh, stretchy buffers in the C code uh, way back at the start of Bitwise. And that is the idea. It would it would be nice, even if you don't have a proper type system for distinguishing stretchy buffs from normal pointers, it would be nice if you had a way of tagging in some way, if only for readability sake, uh, tagging stretchy buffs, just as a way of communicating. Um, and so we have that now, and it's actually related to the way incomplete arrays were reworked. Rather, my rework of incomplete arrays enabled it. So <laughs> what you'll notice here is this looks like an incomplete array. The way this now works is that in previously, if you did this in either in C code or in ion code, it would just say, hey, this is a zero size array. You can't do that. Um, the way it works now mirrors the way it worked, has always worked in C for um, the pointer decay of incomplete arrays in function parameter types. So it, if you've 
this has always been in C, basically identical to having an endpointer. Um, so this is sort of a weird way of, of writing it, and sometimes maybe it has semantic value, but it's pretty rare to see people do it. But this has always been a thing in C. And so I thought, since there's actually no useful real de definition of this right now, um, I guess in C11, I can't remember if C11 actually used this notation or this notation for sort of trailing arrays in um, uh, trailing arrays uh, sort of tails in uh, in structs, but I decided to just basically sort of uh, following following the lead of this kind of pointer decay since this wasn't being used for anything. Uh, let's just make this be a synonym for uh, for pointers, and then we will use that for documentation purposes. And maybe in the future, when we do the compiler rework and we have a better way of, of tracking tags on types in a way that doesn't actually affect the underlying intern type identity, maybe we will also use this to actually drive type system stuff. So, for example, right now you could use you know when you provide this a, it doesn't really care whether it's declared like this or like this. It's it's 100% the same once we're past the type resolution phase. Um, but in the new compiler, when I have a better way to, to to track these kind of tags, I can actually have my intrinsics detect it and provide much better error handling and sanity checking. So that's a longer term prospect once we once the new compiler is in better shape. But for now, uh, I'm switching the, to this convention. Uh, I remember I saw some of the people who were doing their own stretchy buffers based on what we did on stream were using C macros in their C code that look kind of like, you know, like for something like this, they would write, um, I can't even remember specifically, but maybe it was like this, you know, it would, and, and this would basically map to just a pointer declaration. But the point is by using this kind of macro, they were kind of communicating to themselves and others that, hey, on the one hand, this is an array. On the other hand, it has some uh, special magic as well that you can do with it. So, and also be careful, right? Um, so now our convention for that is this, but I want you to remember that semantically it is just a synonym. Uh, and it kind of worked out nicely that this corresponds to the pointer decay case for um, pointer params uh, to, or for uh, incomplete array params to functions. So uh, I changed this throughout. I think this reads much nicer now. Uh, I mean, I, so even though I th this was kind of inspired by someone else's suggestion, I immediately saw the value once I tried implementing it. I, I like it quite a bit. Um, so yeah, um, that was one change. Let me think. There's two other changes. Um, boom, boom, boom. Um, two other changes, maybe not very important ones, to be honest. Um, Oh yeah, no, this is actually an important change. That's the main one I wanted to talk about. So, friends, have you ever been annoyed that you have to cast void chars to void pointers to char pointers all the fucking place in your code because C decided in its infinite wisdom when it added const way back in the 80s after not having it originally, or sorry, after adding void star uh, as a generic pointer type after originally only having char star, they had sort of a, I would say, a split personality for void because on the one hand, it was this really convenient, implicitly convertible type for pointers. On the other hand, uh, you're not allowed to directly do pointer arithmetic on it. But almost always when someone gives you a void star, it's because you're dealing with buffer data that's just treated as an array of bytes. And you actually want to do byte-wise char star style pointer arithmetic. But you can't, at least not in the C standard. It's been an implicit extension in GCC and playing forever, um, but it's not supported on Visual Studio and it's not supported on GCC either. If you use, you know, if you use any of the standard modes like, uh, like this or the uh, or this, um, so it's always been a pain in my ass. I got, kind of got accustomed to it uh, just from overexposure, right? You get you so used to doing stupid things that you uh, don't quite take don't, don't frequently enough take a step back and ask why am I doing this? What is it actually providing? It's just providing pain. So we now have support for. Um, doing uh, pointer arithmetic directly on void stars as if they were char stars. Um, and um, this works for all the cases, um, including, I should have a test case for this, uh, including somewhat weird stuff like this. Okay, this may actually break because I just was working on this specific case. This one is a little bit weird. Okay, that works. Um, so yeah. 
Uh, and let me show you that even though this is totally implicit and there's no warnings or anything, there's no warnings either in the C code. So let me show you that. Uh, the way this actually um, works is that it just does implicit conversions anytime it needs to. So it, it basically does the casts in this generated. Obviously, this code has the usual issues with being over parenthesized compared to idiomatic C code, which will vanish in the newer compiler, which will fix everything. But you can see basically that in all the cases where normally you would need to do char stars, um, char star uh, casts, it now does it for you. Um, and, and you can see it even handles cases like this where you're doing an in place increment it, it, where it has to both do first cast one way then add and then cast back. Uh, actually, I guess we don't have to cast back, but I think it's maybe just a little bit over explicit here because it's trying to handle the general case where after casting to char, you have to explicitly cast back. Does it, you know, it's not taking advantage of the fact that it can silently convert to back to void star. Um, but this work, uh, which it really should. Actually, let me fix that right now. Um, um, So uh, yeah, uh, th this is th this case you see here. You can see the generated C code for this is actually very clean. It's pretty much exactly what you would have to write uh, in order to do the equivalent thing. Uh, I do have uh, th this gets uh, th this template gets used when you're just doing it directly to a variable. In the case where you have an L value that is not um, that that has multiple evaluation issues, like you're using the return value, you're doing something like this, for example. Um, uh, then it ends up having to use an uglier template. Maybe I can, well, I'm not going to show that. But anyway, it has an uglier template where it has to use a temp variable and stuff like that in order to deal, avoid multiple evaluation and illegal aliasing. Sean Barrett helped me shake out some of the potential aliasing issues uh, that I had in my original version of this. But um, fortunately, even though this code is ugly, uh, it basically never gets generated for real world code. But this is just to be totally complete. Um, the, the case you get 99% of the time, of course, is that you're incrementing a variable, not some general L value expression. So anyway, we have that now. And I wanted to, uh, just to give you a sense of, of how much this helps the code, uh, I wanted to show you a diff on um, on some of the code you already that we actually wrote on stream together uh, to see how much neater it got and cleaner. And you can actually see the algebraic structure instead of just uh, a sea of casts. Um, yeah, so so you can see uh, there's a lot of this stuff that just goes away. This this is I mean this is more just annoying, but not that bad. The the case that gets really annoying is is down here, uh, this one. Um, where do you see just the diff? Okay. Um, but anyway. This, this case was the one that finally broke me and, and got me to change because I was, uh, for a, this is for the ACAT end function, in order to handle uh, a case where the, the source buffer aliases the destination buffer, the destination buffer gets reallocated by fit. In order to detect that case, you have to do a pointer interval check. And there is so much pointer arithmetic to do. Now, I, again, for almost any of these cases, there's a solution that minimizes the number of casts, but it has other issues. Like, for example, if the first thing you do upon entry to a function is convert all your void star pointers to char stars, then you're in the nice world of just char star arithmetic. Everything is fine. But you shouldn't have to do that. Like, I actually think that uh, too many local variables is a problem in code because then it turns into assembly code where you have to... Uh, you know, mentally trace through the chain of assignments and stuff like that in order to figure out what, what happens. One of the great benefits of just using expressions directly is that everything is right there in a compact form. You don't have to sort of mentally trace through a chain of assignments. So uh, having to always, you know, assign void stars to char stars right at the entry to a function in order to avoid multiple casts uh, for the same variable uh, constantly 
is just it sh shouldn't be necessary and now it isn't so you can see one two three four five casts in uh in two lines is now zero so the so suddenly this code is extremely readable um if the pointer changed after the refit and uh our source pointer is in the range of the source buffer then relocate the source pointer by taking the base pointer of the new buffer and adding the offset uh, of the source buffer within the destination buffer. So now, now it couldn't be simpler. Um, so yeah, ever since I did this, I'm like, why didn't I do this earlier? This is so nice, especially, I mean, for a systems language program, I, I claim that like 99% of, uh, of, of C programmers, when they see void star mentally, they think char star, like, except that it's like void star is char star, but with looser, uh, conversion semantics. That's essentially the way it gets used in practice. And so all the casts are just semantic noise, uh, syntactic noise and semantic noise. All right. Um, let's see if there's questions before I cover the, the other thing that changed. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, I think that, that that's a nice change. And it's kind of pointing the way towards the way things have been going with our changes relative to C, which is we're not making the language less like C. We're in some sense making it more like C than C, if that makes sense. Because I feel like this is something that C would do uh, that so, sort of it didn't do for maybe political reasons, weird historical reasons. Uh, but I feel like this is more C than C, if that makes sense, uh, in this specific instance at least. Uh, and arguably, there's another version of that coming up in my next, next example, um, which I'm going to go through now. And this one is much more experimental. So unlike the pointer arithmetic thing, I don't want to present it as a fait accompli where it's already done and uh, this is the, the writ from God or whatever. I, this is just what I'm experimenting with. I want feedback on it. Uh, it's possible I'll totally roll it back, but for now, this is what I'm doing. So the, the motivation was that I was tooling around with, um, some code. I'm trying to remember what was the specific code. It was in here somewhere. Actually, there's two cases. I think I even alluded to it on one of the streams. On the one hand, we had this annoying issue with any. Any is this thing that is supposed to be a, this ubiquitous interchange format for data. Uh, one of the problems was I had already realized this all immediately, but it was such a painful realization on some level that I, I, I just, you know, what do you call it? I just ignored it. Like I, uh, uh, when, when you try to block something out, you don't want to think about it because the implications are too stressful or something. But basically, the problem with the any type is that you're only allowed, it takes a void star. So it, 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 you can't take a void const star, right? Like it requires a void star. Now, in most cases, that's not a problem because most of the any implicit any conversions are, um, are from temp L values, right? Like all the, uh, if you go and look at, um, um, all this stuff where we have these inferred uh, L values, uh, these are all modifiable, even though they're based on R values that in, in no sense are modifiable. In fact, they're not even objects in memory. They're just like mathematical constants. Um, you know, the thing they actually get is modifiable. So even if they modify it or whatever, it's like, sure, that's a temp copy loser. You, you go nuts on that thing. Um, so th that's not really a problem there. But still, if you wanted to faithfully capture the types, it's like you, you run into this issue where, shit, it's just like the iterator versus const iterator issue in, in C++ where you would need to have this version. And so you would need to, or probably more likely, you would, uh, you would probably do something like this. Um, this is the slightly less ugly version. And then you would say, uh, you know, maybe part of the type tag would be a bit that says whether it's const or not. So then you would have to discriminate on that to know which one you're allowed to use or something like that. But I mean, I think all of these things have various kinds of problems once you work through the, the chain of implications. So this just made me upset. That was one case. Then I was looking at some other code, which I can't remember if I ever showed on stream, <clears throat> but when I was working out, let me just turn on my fan. It's getting really warm in here. I'll just turn it away from you a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Um, let me finish my thought, then I'll answer your question about memmove versus memcopy. Um, um, boom, 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 boom. 
Right, so uh, a while back I figured out this nice simple protocol for doing iterators that also works with a shorthand for syntax, that's the two clause, the truncated two, two clause for syntax. And the basic, uh, the basic template or protocol, if you will, is you have, you have a creation function that just returns uh, not, a, not a pointer, but um, you know, an object, uh, like a static object. And then uh, there's a function that returns a bool that operates in place via pointer passing on the iterator. And then the, the current result of the iterator in terms of you know, what you would normally think of as the return value from an iterator when you pump it is actually embedded in the struct. And uh, aside from just having a very nice idiom here for iteration, this is actually better, I claim, than the standard sort of, a lot, the way a lot of languages do, actually C++ kind of does it like this too. But the way a lot of languages do iterators is that as soon as you're, you're returning more than one piece of data, you have to wrap it in a tuple or some other container. And one of the nice ways of side effects of this approach of doing pointer passing and just modifying the value that's the new result in place is that you can just store uh, named fields and arbitrarily many values that are sort of associated. Um, so anyway, this was this is a fairly nice way of doing iterators. If you look at the implementations of one of these guys, um, you can see that how simple it is. You uh, you get a string, and so you have a pointer to that string in your internal. Uh, iterator and then when you do next you basically as long as there's still strings uh, string data left you uh, you repeatedly return these intervals corresponding to lines um, and this is fine for what it is but um, look again this only works when we're dealing with const data uh, const char data so if I wanted to use this for modifying a string in place Admittedly, for this specific case of line enumeration, in-place modification is a less frequent scenario, but could still happen. Um, but for the general case, this is absolutely something that happens. And you don't want to force people to have two versions of everything in order to propagate consonants. This is exactly the problem that's always been an issue in C and C++, but especially C++ with const correctness, is that you end up having duplicates of a, a crap load of functions and data structures that need to propagate the constness or non constness of their inputs. It's a, a problem that I don't think people will talk about enough. So I was sort of getting upset about this and felt like I had to confront it. Um, if, if you want to see, I wrote this little blurb where I give this really pathological example. I mean, I'll, I'll show the C++ example and then I'll talk about my, my current experimental design for resolving the issue. Um, so yeah, this is, this is basically perfectly equivalent to uh, to this case here, except you don't have to do two versions of the data structure because if you have a const x implicitly, um, you, you can still use const methods so you can return a const reference to one of the fields. So the C++ case is actually a little better, bit better than what we have because at least you can kind of have an overloaded function and so you don't have to push different names on the user depending on which case is which. Um, but you still end up, in this case, you know, most of the time this boilerplate ends up being fairly thin boilerplate, um, but it is boilerplate. It ends up being copy and paste code where you have to say, you have to say, in both cases, you just write return X in the implementations of these accessors. Uh, in some cases, it's harder to do that. Uh, there's a little deeper, uh, you have to go in order to to handle both the constant and the unconstant case. But in general, it's a problem. So even in C++, where you can a const x will let you dispatch on two different kinds of methods and so on, or two different kinds of overloaded functions in general if it's a non-member function. Um, at least in this case, you only have to implement two variants of every access or method that returns pointers or references to their members. Um, but the general case does require you to uh, implement two data structures as well. And the classic example is iterator and const iterator. And it perfectly corresponds to this case here. If I'm iterating over a const container, then I want to return const pointers to the elements. If I'm iterating over a non-const container, then I want to return non-const pointers to the elements because I want people to be able to use my iterator and then modify the mutable container in place, right? This is a, a, an imperative language. You want to be able to do that. Um, and so, yeah, so this is the sort of thing that happens. Here's a case that's really a crazy version of this um, because even though there's three fields here, all of them really, the constants of all these three fields depends on the constants of a single ultimate input, which is this one. Like if you want to think about it in terms of propagation of constants, this const, if, if this was like a polymorphic tag, this would be propagated down to all of these members basically. So. All of these would be either const or non-const, depending on whether this thing was const or non-const. Um, 
but you, here's the general case. This is a more extreme version of this where you have pointers to five structs and you want to return an iterator like thing. This would be like a simultaneous iterator over five different containers. And depending, and you want to preserve the constants for the, uh, this iterator, the simultaneous iterator, so that for any combination of const and non-const for the five uh, containers you're iterating over, you want to pres you preserve that constants in the iterator so that you can mutate the non-const elements through it. That's a really, like, if you have a simultaneous iterator, this could actually occur, although maybe not with five, maybe with two, which is what I've seen in practice. But the crazy thing about this case, if you want to implement all the versions of the struct for const and non-const of each of these five fields, and similarly for the function, you end up needing two to the five, right? Because you need all the combinations. There's two choices for each uh, const and non-const uh, field and, and, and input. Uh, and so that's 32. Uh, and this goes to two to the n in the general case where you have n things that can independently vary their constants. So this is pretty pretty insane. Even the n equals one case, which is basically the const versus const iterator versus iterator case, even that is insane. And um, one of the things that always annoyed me when I was more of a serious C++ person is how much stupid const versus non-const boilerplate I'd had to write in order to write a library that was uh, user-friendly in the sense that the user could use it with either const or non-const uh, values. So anyway, um, that's my, my rant about C and C++ style const. In practice, it's much worse than C++ because mostly because of idioms. As this example shows, the same problem can occur in C. It's just the fact that the idioms of C++ programming tend to generate a lot more of this issue than C programming. Um, but anyway, I was thinking about this and getting kind of upset. And then I realized, well, I didn't realize. I thought, you know what? I don't actually think, I mean, I'm one of those people who have for 20 plus years have done const correct programming pretty much religiously. Not, I mean, religiously in the sense that I rarely deviated from it, but not in the sense that I really believed very deeply in it if I examined my beliefs. So for example, you know, I think that the main value of this is just documentation about which things you're supposed to modify and which things you're not supposed to modify. I, I don't really believe, quite frankly, that uh, it helps me uh, deal with memory bugs or stuff like that where I'm writing to memory I shouldn't be writing to. Uh, and so given that this, all this downside, which I think is fairly substantial, it shouldn't exist at all, um, I, I basically thought, okay, what about if we can just basically get rid of const in a sense? And so that's what I did in the current implementation. I'll show you how it works in the code in a second. But basically, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly summarize what I wrote here. Basically, what I do now is that the const keyword still exists. I mean, for example, you can see it's it's here. It's uh, it's here in the code we wrote last time. So you can see it's used here to signify which things we write to and which things we read from. Um, and again, I think that's actually valuable. Like. Uh, this is a nice way of documenting uh, parameters and stuff and, and you know global variables and all kinds of stuff. Um, so that's still there. The keyword is still there. Um, but basically anytime a type is resolved, uh, anytime a type specifier, in other words, the syntactic designation of a type is resolved to an internal type, a semantic type, the thing that actually gets checked, um, const is now a no-op um, in the sense that it, it's, you, you, it doesn't exist basically. Uh, at any lower level of the type system. And so you can freely, uh, I mean, I guess I can show you, um, you can freely, I really shouldn't do this because it's probably going to crash somewhere else, but actually let, let me show you with just a fresh example. Um, um, if I have um, if I have this and I have this, you can now do the, you can you can now do this. And now I'm sure the compiler doesn't work. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is not actually getting test const. Okay, so now this kind of thing just works. Um, it, so if you look at the, uh, the generated code, you can see there's no constant site. 
the cost is only on our side. It's just a tag for, um, it's almost like the way, you know, the new, this one is the same as this, but um, communicates intent. Um, it's very much like that. And so that's now the case for all internal const. In some sense, all the cons that are inside our world are now treated that way. Um, and so you don't have to worry about const correctness and all this duplication. Now, the one case where we actually need it, given that, especially given that we generate C code, is for interacting with foreign libraries in or foreign code, foreign C code in both directions. So the, the two directions are, I am using a, I am using, I'm calling functions. I'm calling functions in a foreign library. Well, fortunately, that direction is easy. If all the data on my side is like non-const, then I can always pass it to a sync that expects a const value, right? If I have a char star and there's a function that, it, that accepts a, a const char star, well, I can pass that because I have what is sort of a more general thing than what they're expecting. So that implicitly converts, right? That's standard. So that direction is easy. As long as I'm just calling their functions, even if they are const correct on their function signatures, no problem, all my data is non-const. I have the most general kind of data. So I can give that to them. So that's an easy case. Um, there are cases that are harder. For example, if the foreign API has a callback and that callback has a signature which has const is, an, uh, is a const star, uh, const int star or something like that, um, then when they call me, the signature in order to match at the C level has to have int const star or const int star. I'm confusing the C and I on order. Um, and so we do have to handle that. And so uh, for cases like that, const is respected. And let me show you. Uh, actually, I don't have the callback case, but I have, okay, I guess I stubbed this out because I don't have an implementation of this. But um, the only thing it's complaining about here is the foreign function isn't defined. There's just a signature. Um, actually, let me just stub that in. And that, that should compile. Okay, I keep pressing a button that switches windows. So now see what happens here is that we have this foreign function and this foreign function returns a, a const int star. Um, and so we really, given that this is their signature, like we can't change the signature, it's their signature. When we're interacting with them, we really do have to respect it. Um, and that's why anytime you have a declaration that's marked foreign, which is a keyword we already use for interacting with uh, foreign libraries, Anytime you have type specifiers in parts of foreign declarations, the const is actually interpreted. So it turns into the old const we had before, right? Because we already had const, C style const semantics in our type system. So this doesn't require additional work. Essentially all that happens is that now the only case that will actually generate this is things like this. And also if you do very, if you do explicit casts to a const, it will respect the const keyword in those designations too. But Otherwise, for declarations and such, it's only in foreign declarations that it's actually heated. Um, and the way it handles it, you can see it handles it transparently. Uh, because look, look what happens here. I'm calling the foreign func, and it returns an int const star. Uh, the actual type here is what? Well, I can tell you what it is on the ion side. It's just an int star. Um, because th the thing it does is it casts away the constants as soon as it gets it. Right now, obviously, this doesn't mean that you should mutate the data through this, but that's your job as a programmer. What it does is it immediately strips away the constants of any pointers and so on at the boundary between foreign code and your code. And at that point, you're inside the comfortable world of nothing is const, and you don't have to worry about const correct uh, const correctness and duplication for that uh, to maintain and propagate that. Um, so that's how it works now. And uh, the same is true for structs. I guess I have an example here. Um, oh, and I also want to show you that this doesn't, it only casts away the constants in cases that C actually allows. So you can cast away the constants of pointers in this vein. You can't, if someone has a, a struct like this, so let me first show you what happens with this foreign struct. Um, God, why does it keep doing that? Uh, foreign struct. So you can see the foreign struct does have the constness in its field. Um, if you look at how this is used, um, it doesn't, it, it, you know, so in this case, it's assigning to the non-const field. But if I do this, 
Ion is actually, even the Ion compiler, not the C compiler, I, Ion is going to say, hey, you're trying to modify a non-modifiable type. You can't do that. So it's not that it's somehow playing fast and loose with const in the sense that it's just pretending it doesn't exist. It has the full semantics, but they're only there for foreign things uh, where you have to, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're in their country. You, you can't impose your norms on them. You have to work within their norms and their expectations. And so if they say what, you know, what things are const and non-const when it comes from them. And uh, you have basically two choices. You can cast it away, but then you still have to observe the underlying non-mutability of the data, perhaps. Or in the case of things that can't be const cast, like these fields, um, it won't let you do it. Now, if you were a very nasty boy, here's what you could do. Um, of course, you always have this option. Um, you can do an explicit cast. Um, and you've already always been able to do that in C. So you still have that option. But what I want to emphasize is that the implicit uh, const casting that happens at the boundary only happens for pointers and maybe a few other cases that I can't remember. But the point is, it's not that it, it, that there's some sort of brain dead const stripping that just kind of like goes over and whacks out every const on the boundary. It, it, it's very considered by, in terms of what C actually allows you to do as just a transparent thing. So in cases like this, it won't, you know, it won't implicitly do the equivalent of this. That would be, uh, uh, I, I think would go, go totally against the, the you know the expectations of, of anyone so you can you, you still have to explicitly cast if this is what you run into but um in terms of pointers and such like this foreign funk it gets cast away in the boundary everything is now in, in your world on your terms you can do whatever you want uh, without worrying about const correctness there um, the other direction is pretty similar if you're exposing an api to them um, like for example suppose you have a function which takes a name so you're, you're, you have your Iron library, you want to give it to a C programmer. Um, if you give a library to a C programmer and you're not a psychopath, you definitely want to have function signatures that have const char stars for names and stuff like that. And buffers more generally. Any read-only buffer needs to be const void star, const char star. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're, you're just sort of like a solipsist who pretends the world doesn't exist. This is basically an example of what's, the, what's that principle be... Be generous in what you accept. I can't remember what you call that engineering principle, but it's this idea that you know you want to make it easy for them, and so you want to provide them a way for them without. You don't want to force them to do const casts, right? You, you if there has to be const casting to to connect the two worlds, it should happen on your side, not on their side, because they're oblivious to your insane ideology about constness. So that's basically what you want to have, and the way that that happens. And I haven't implemented this because. It's trivial, but basically, um, if you look currently at the way, um, not, not, it's not here. It's uh, software. if you look at how, I won't go over the detail, but is decal foreign. If you look at the way a lot of this stuff works, it decides currently, and this should be factored out. Um, this should be called something else. Like basically, I, there's going to be a function called is 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 decal constrict or something like that. And then constrictness is a feature of certain declarations, which right now are just foreign declarations. But it will also be so-called export declarations, where if I have a function entry point that I want to export to uh, uh, either a function entry point or a struct that I want them to fill in, any time where they have to put in their data and my stuff, uh, I can mark it export. And so if you imagine that you're writing a C library and there's two parts to the exported, sorry, you're writing an ion library and you want to export it as a C library. Conceptually, let's say there's two parts to the export. There's the header file and there's the C file. Whether they're physically one file or not is irrelevant to, to this point. There's the interface, which is all the symbols that are in the .h. And there's the implementation, which is all the internal junk, which is in .c. And the two shall never, you know, like those are decoupled. There's no visibility. They're all static on one side so that they don't even leak visibility and into the linker or whatever. Um, so the way to think about it is in order to control that visibility from the C side, you want to have some notion of exporting. And then the idea is when you do that kind of external exporting for C libraries, that implicitly confers this strict const interpretation. And then again, when you interface with those things, even though they're now not really foreign, they're really your own, but they're kind of set up for foreign um, trafficking, uh, then the same kind of implicit const casting will happen. 
uh, where possible. And maybe in some cases you would have to do um, actual nasty casts explicitly, but I don't think so. I think the 99.9999 case is exactly what we have here with, with pointers. Um, and that's just handled implicitly at the boundary. So that's the current system. Essentially, you know, the idea behind it is const is primarily documentation. It shouldn't burden you, but we still have to interrupt cleanly with C libraries in both directions, both as a consumer of libraries as, as, and as a producer of libraries. And uh, modulo minor bugs that I haven't shaken out yet because I implemented it last night, I think this actually does the job. So my plan is to experiment with this, just use this, uh, try to keep track of whether there are any bugs we run into. And by bugs, I mean, I don't mean something I can fix in a second. I mean some substantial thing that would be, that takes a half an hour to fix. That, that's my minimum bar for bugs, uh, probably. Uh, certainly anything that's like a minute to fix is on the same level as a compiler error, and I don't think should meaningfully be considered a bug. Those occur all the time with C pointer and memory stuff, and people overstate how important those bugs are. Any bug that can be immediately fixed is not really a bug in a meaningful sense. So the, I'm going to track bugs that are, are not detected immediately. And I'm going to be, you know, sort of honest with myself about what cons have made a difference. And then I'm going to look at that data in a few months and see what the results were and make some kind of long-term determination. And in the meanwhile, I would love feedback on this. And especially with the interop side, if you guys can think of cases where this kind of cons casting of pointers at the boundary does not seamlessly give you what you want, um, I would love to hear about it. But anyway, that's uh, where I am as of now. And uh, this is going to be an experiment, but uh, I already feel pretty good about it, and we'll see how it turns out. Um, all right. Um, let me see if there's any questions here. Okay, memo. Let me go back to pop the stack. Um, uh, about memo. Someone was asking about memo. Uh, I guess there's a general point to be made here. So memmove, the difference between memmove uh, and, and memcopy has to do with the, the direction the, the copy has to take place. Um, let's see how the standard actually phrases it um, in terms of that directionality. Right, you're allowed to have overlapping objects. And if you have overlapping objects, you sometimes have to copy from the back to the front rather than front to back. And basically the way memmove detects that is just by checking for the ordering, like it, it, it checks for the, the ordering of the pointers and does it in the, let's see, it does it so that you always, if the destination is lower than the source, um, I guess you have to copy uh, from, from front to back, otherwise in the reverse order. Um, so anyway, the point is, historically, there is this stupid distinction between memmove and memcopy in the standard, in terms of what the standard guarantees. Now in practice, for a long time, C library implementations have actually had their memcopy do the same thing, except maybe in static cases where they can determine exactly what is required, like for static addresses or something like that. And their memcopy has always been the same as memmove. It's just been a synonym. And in fact, there's a lot of code out there that relies on that behavior now. So uh, I haven't done the memmove equivalent for the library yet in um, in... Uh, in our std.ion stuff, so I'm just using the libc memmove. Um, but I can tell you right now what it's going to do. There's not going to be a difference between memmove and memcopy. There's just going to be memcopy, and it does the equivalent of memmove, because the only cost is the single if check uh, on uh, for the even, and that's for the dynamic case. If you have any static information about the destination source pointers, that can be eliminated completely, even. Uh, and you can also do unrolling and other stuff in that case to completely unroll the loop. But um, um, the point is, the memmove versus memcopy distinction was a pretty silly one. It doesn't amount to a real optimization. Uh, most C libraries already treat memmove as memcopy. Oh, sorry, the other way around, memcopy as memmove. There's code that depends on it. Um, so this was pretty much a design mistake, I would say, in the library to try to make a fine distinction about this. And especially now that standard libraries started offering memmove semantics for memcopy, uh, it's basically, weird. even if you had a strong opinion about this previously, we're past the point of no return. Given that that's the case, uh, I recently started just using memmove for everything, and I started doing it in this code for the for the preparation of writing our buffer manipulation functions, which will just defer to memmove, basically. So our, our version of memcopy will always defer to memmove. There is no two functions. You just use one function. It does that single if check at the top implicitly when needed, 
in order to determine what the traversal order should be for the copy. And that, that's the end of it. So um, I've had so many stupid bugs over the years because I think MSVC does not make a distinction between memcopy and memmo. And I had many bugs over the years. I mean, they're usually pretty easy to find, but they can actually be a little bit subtle compared to some other bugs relating to memory. Um, and it's just silly because it's it's not something that you should have to think about too hard. Just have one function that does the right thing, right, and done. All right, um, so that's kind of the answer about memmove. Uh, or were you were you talking about me oh maybe you weren't really talking about what I thought you were talking about. I meant to say why mem move instead of mem copy. Um, boom, 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 boom. Oh, you, you you did say mem copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's basically the answer. I thought maybe you were also asking what about mem copy versus explicit initialization. Um, and the answer is well, it, it, what I mean by explicit initialization is just using a struct assignment or something like that to zero a struct versus using mem copy or mem zero or something like that. Uh, memset. Um, that turns out to be a little bit more compiler dependent. Uh, in theory, memcopy should always behave well and should be fast even for small operands. In practice, some compilers have memcopies that are overly optimized for huge memcopies and have too much setup cost for short ones. However, um, we can always do our own wrapper that is very fast with that is very fast for um, for small operands if that becomes an issue. So we're going to revisit that once we do more sort of empirical performance work on different uh, platforms and compilers. Um, but yeah, that's that's the long-term plan there. Yep, yep, cool. All right. Um, okay, so what did we cover? Void star, uh, pointer arithmetic, new cont semantics. Um, I think that's it in terms of review. Uh, there's a lot, you can see a lot has been getting, a lot of code has been written in the last four or five days since I restarted streaming again. So uh, there is a bit to catch up on. I don't want to completely ignore it. Um, and I wanted to, I, I can't do a monster long stream today. I think we've already gone uh, for about an hour. So I'm probably going to go another hour or so. And then uh, I won't do a five hour stream this time, I promise. So um, let's implement a data structure before we finish that is the next one we need and we can build it on top of our hash map. And that's the, the name map. So if you recall, um, for string interning, uh, this is something we use in several places, um, but, but especially for keyword interning, uh, or uh, not, not just keyword, identifier interning in our lexer, and this is how we sort of standardize names up front in the compilation pipeline. The way this is implemented um, is, um, I'm not gonna completely repeat the idea, um, but there's a subtle, there is a somewhat subtle thing that people missed the first time around that I, I explained it back then, but I'm gonna explain it again now. The idea behind this data structure is that in order to handle variable length data, what you do is you use a hash, you, you, hash, um, you hash the variable length data to a fixed size token, right? So imagine you have a one megabyte file as an extreme case, not that you would really want to enter in a one megabyte file, but imagine you have a, had a one megabyte file and you wanted to use it as a key in a hash table. Um, here's what you do. You, you, you use a good hash function, not crypto strength, but a good one, just a good practical one for hash table usage. And then you, um, you hash your one megabyte down to 32 bits or 64 bits. 64 bits is very uh, sufficient. Uh, for what we're doing, but even 32 bits, uh, we did some empirical testing and even the sort of statistics of, of birthday paradoxes kind of shows that in most cases that's fine. Um, but yeah, you cook it down to this fixed size token. And then the idea is that if you have a good hash function, this basically behaves randomly. And so you can just do probability theory to figure out the chances of collisions. And it turns out that basically, if you have, if you have a 64-bit uh, a token, you need on the order of two to the 32, so half as many bits, two to the half as many bits as there are in the hash token in order to probably have even one collision. Um, and so what you can do is you can have a two-tiered lookup where the outer lookup uses the variable length hash as the key. And then the, the thing that's stored in the table is a chain of things, of strings that have that hash. 
So this is essentially external chaining, but unlike the normal case of external chaining, the internal table is open addressed, of course. The external chain in almost all cases only has one entry and the chain is only really to handle the exceptional case where you get collisions and it's going to be very rare for non-crafted, non-adversarial inputs. Uh, and we're not really trying to be adversary proof with, uh, with this kind of code. Um, and so that's the idea is we do this we use a hash table. The hash table is indexed by a hash. Internally, it's going to rehash that again, which is a little bit redundant. Um, but it's, it's rehashing just 32 bits rather than uh, you know, a megabyte, so it's not really that important. Uh, the one megabyte hashing is going to be the expensive part. Even if it rehashes uh, 64 bits to 64 bits, that's a drop in the bucket right, for a variable length data. So it will rehash it, and then it will use that for its internal hashing. Um, but, but the idea is then that uh, we're going to do the lookup based on this digest of the one megabyte string or whatever it is we're passing in. And then we get back the chain of all the strings in the, t in the table, which have that same digest. And again, the statistics tell you that for a good hash function with, with very high probability until you, unless you either have adversarial inputs that actually try to craft uh, collisions or you have a, you have too many t things in the table relative to the number of hash bits you use as a key. Uh, only in that case do you expect a collision at all anywhere in the table. And so in practice, there's only going to be one thing that matches. That's the idea. And so this is why we have this very simple code. Uh, we do the variable length hash. We use the variable length hash as the key. And then we go through the chain and we actually verify the match. Um, and that's it. Um, and then this thing also manages the string data. Uh, there's basically a big... Um, um, there's a big buffer that it gets append where all the string data along with the, the header for the, for the chaining gets appended just sequentially. So there's no separate allocations for every entry in the name map. Uh, all that string data and header data just gets put into a big buffer. Uh, here we're using a block-based arena allocator so that, for example, if you have one megabyte blocks, it's going to keep concatenating to the existing block until it fills up, and then it's going to make a new block, link it into the existing blockchain, and go on and on. So this is a very efficient way of storing this data and uh, minimizing the number of external memory allocations. Um, external chaining. Well, internal chaining doesn't work for, um, let's see. The hash table itself is internally chained. There's two levels of hashing. It's only the second level outer hash that's chained. Uh, there's no point not to do it because there's only ever one collision. Or, you know, there's never collisions, basically. Practically, there's never collisions. Uh, the chaining is only a fallback for pathological or unlucky cases. Um, the internal table is still the old hash map. You know, this was a linear probe. This was similar to what we have now. So anyway, I'm going to do this. Um, and so basically what we want is we want something a little bit more general purpose than this. Uh, we're going to make something that I think, I'm, I've been thinking about names for all the standard library stuff. I think I'm going to call it a name map. Uh, and it's basically this kind of thing here, but, uh, but not global. It's something you can actually instantiate in multiple instances. And maybe there's also a global default name map you can use for convenience, but um, that has potential issues with threat safety and stuff. So you definitely want at the minimum to have a version that's freestanding that's not coupled to global variables. That much is obvious. Um, so let's do that. Um, um, in the first version, I'm not going to do the arena allocator uh, because I want to do, I have a new allocation framework in mind for doing allocators uh, in the standard library, which allows pluggable allocators for everything. I don't want to broach that subject uh, sort of as a side topic to this, and we only have about an hour left. So I'm just going to do separate allocations rather than this big buffer, but um, Rest assured that we will do something very, very similar uh, with a pluggable allocator scheme as soon as we uh, cover allocators, which will probably be next stream. Um, all right, so um, let me just put it at the top of the file. So we want to have a structure called a name map. And uh, what is it going to be? It's going to be um, a hash map. And so it's going to be, um, Um, I'm going to call it the chain map, and it's going to map from uint32 to, uh, to chains, uh, 
uh, maybe I'll call it a link map or a, a node map. Um, and so a node, again, we will change this later, but for now let's just separately allocate the data rather than kind of putting it consecutively. Uh, a node is going to be, uh, well, there's going to be the chain, there's going to be uh, the length, and let's just make it 32 bits, um, and then there's going to be the string data. Um, Actually, I think I broke this when I repurposed uh, the syntax. Um, let me just see, let's quickly fix that if that doesn't work. Oh, yeah. Okay, there's some dependency tracking for um, tuples that's not being done correctly right now. Um, I don't want to deal with that, so I'm going to quickly um, put in some dummy code to reference that. Oh, I see. Some of the tuple stuff, I didn't talk about it much, but some of it is a little bit undercooked, but um, um, so I'm kind of fi fixing stuff as I go here. Uh, type def struct. Does this use a temp buffer? It probably does, right? <laughs> no, it does stir up. Uh, Let's see here. Okay, that, that looks reasonable, right? Oh, right. Sorry, that's how we handle it. We don't do it in line. That's why it was confusing. One second. Um... Okay, so why is this not triggering? Yeah, I guess that's what it was. Okay, I mean, that looks correct, right? Use of undefined type tuple four. I'm looking right at it. Um,
it's defined before. That's why I don't understand what's going on. It's defined right here. Um, there are other cases in the type info, like this one. Well, it's certainly also not specifying the right type. So it says type none for tuples. Um, gen type info. Let, let me just quickly. Sorry for the quick diversion here. Um, Can anyone guess what the heck this is? Let's look at this macro. Maybe there's some weird stuff. So it's size of, so it takes size of the tuple four. Oh, sorry, yeah. Use of undefined, let me actually go further down. It's good. It, Oh, that's what the problem is. Sorry, this is just Visual Studio being obnoxious. It's because it's failing the comp it's failing the creation of the type here, and then the other one is a red herring. So this is the actual error. Um, so this is a pointer to a name node. I see. It's still not uh, generating the reference to the name node. Um, hang on. This is just some kind of dependency tracking fail. It's because. I know what it is. It's because, let me get rid of it temporarily and then I will do that off stream because this is kind of gnarly compiler work. I'm not, I'm not doing proper tracking right now, recursive for fields referenced in, um, actually, let, let, let me see. I think I can do it pretty easily actually. Um, Um, I'm trying to remember where do we call this? We can call it probably somewhere else. Okay, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with it right now. This should be getting called. It should be getting uh, recursively put in the sorted sims and um, emit something. Um, so I, I know how to provoke it to emit it. I just have to um, I should be able to do something like that for now. Maybe the problem is just this. It's probably not about that. Um, I 
why would that not get, be getting emitted? I wonder if this is if this recursive pointer. Uh, okay. Let me just put in. It, it, it's it's clearly some kind of resolver thing, where this is what it appears to be. Um, Okay. Um, not the kind of bug I want to work on on stream, uh, given our time crunch. So let, let, let's try to do the workaround. Um, first, let, let me just verify that these different things actually work. Okay, so I don't think that was the issue. Um, and these things are getting emitted. Um, all right. So first, actually, let's try a few things first. Let's try instantiating, let, let's try making this not a field, but just um, a local. Okay, so that works too. So it's, it's related, well, let's try reintroducing it and see if that's even it. Um, it seems related to the fact that it's a field specifically. Okay, no, it's not even that. So it's it's just it's 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 something even more trivial. Okay, so let's just keep it this way. We need this test code anyway. Then I'll I'll figure out why. Um, I know I actually I think I know what the oh actually I know what the problem is. The problem is I'm always okay. So let me tell you what the problem is. When I hacked in two pulse in the generator, um, I always emit type definitions for two pulse. But if they reference something that did not get emitted because it's not actually reachable, then you can imagine what happens. So that's that's the issue anyway. So we just have to make sure that all its dependencies are actually referenced and that's the dumb bug, I'll fix it off stream. Um, all right. So, uh, okay, this is our, let me just make sure. Okay, good, good, good. Hello, I see someone's coming in. All right, let's do the, let's do the name map. Uh, let's do the name map. So uh, what do we have to do? Um, we basically have to write um, name get. So you pass in a string. Um, and probably, let's see here. Um, So the idea is, uh, this is not necessarily what you want to use, but this is the version when you pass in a slice. So there will be a zero terminated front end as well, but this is going to be the workhorse, just like it was in our other code. So let's see, what do we want? Um, we're going to uh, hash, uh, we're going to hash the buffer, and then we're going to um, get, um, We're going to get the um, let's call this notes. Um, we're going to do the lookup based on that, and uh, um, assuming we get a hit. We are going to um, actually um, do 
whatchamacallit, uh, going to going to go and look at that node. Actually, let's do use a pointer to it so we can update it in place. And uh, oh, I guess it is a pointer in its own right, so that's not really needed. Uh, and then you just do the usual like list stuff um, for every node, um, you check that they match, and so you um, let's just put it not. Um, you check that they match, and if they do, then you're done. Um, so let, let's do this. Um, so this is null, and so this will be null if this is not the case, and also if this uh, search change search terminates without a match. Um, and so once we're here, then we know that uh, there wasn't a match, and so now we're going to allocate a, uh, a new name node, um, and we're going to essentially um, allocate what we need, which is length plus one um, and then um, actually let, let me think is that really true? Um, you want to do something slightly different. You want to do, you want to store off this, um, uh, so that you can link in the head of the chain. The most recent thing inserted, uh, and then this should not be. Let's call it it for iterator. It's a nice shorthand. Um, okay, and then once we're at this point, then we're going to say new node is this. Um, new node points to the previous node, and the length is the new thing, and we have to. Uh, well, actually, I, I am going to use an mcopy here, but. Uh, let's see, new node, string, string length plus one, and then you have to actually zero terminate this. Uh, and then you have to actually insert it in the map, so now we have to do names, nodes, new node. And then I guess we need a I'll just call this buff actually, because it's kind of, um, I, I kind of want to convey that it's a buffer as opposed to a super terminated string once we're at this point. Um, and this is a string on the other hand. <laughs> Oh, and the thing you want to return, of course. Um, so let's see. This is, so this is, the, I guess this is not quite true. Let's see. Um, we only want to insert if we don't find a match. Um, so let's see. This is when we found a match. So in that case, we want to return this. Uh, otherwise we get to this point and the thing we want to return is this. And so now in this case, let's just be lazy and use Sterlin 
if you if you can potentially integrate the zero termination search somehow in a single function, but uh, let's just do Sterlin for now at least. Um, so that's stir Sterlin, something like that. Um, all right, so let's test that. By the way, this is much nicer than the old code. Further proof that uh, not only did we meet our old bar for uh, for stretchy buffs and hash maps and stuff, but we've, I think, exceeded it by quite a bit. So um, already quite encouraging. Um, so anyway, let's... Um, Let's just uh, do something like this. Um, okay, the compiler is crashing. To interpret the signs. Um, by the way, for anyone who's ever skeptical about um, the value of asserts. You guys have no idea how easy it is to add new stuff to this compiler purely on the back of that. Because look what happens. I forgot to handle tuples, which are a new addition to the type system, and it just explodes right when I, when I need to add the code. The combination of an IDE with a good debugger and that, that can just tell you stuff makes means that stuff like this you know, you, you just jump right to the side of the problem and you can write the code and you're done. Um, so anyway, I think that the type name they're talking about here is for debugging purposes. So uh, basically, we want to just generate something that matches the canonical syntax. Um, and so... I guess it's num fields. What is the thing we do for structs? I guess for structs we actually don't. Let me just let me just jog my memory. Uh, num fields. Yep, yeah, that's what we use. Okay, so num fields. Um, So it was it was basically just trying to give me a type error, but um, it didn't know how to print the type in type errors, like in error messages. So that's what we're doing now. Um, Okay, so that was not actually not it. That's interesting. Oh, turns out we still have to put bricks in C. Okay, so now we have a type error. Thank you very much, type system working as intended, because um, 
we want the key, the value part. And so here we also want the value part and the value part and the value part. Conditional expression must have scalar type. Um, oh, I guess now actually what we want is um, we want, yeah, we don't need to do this, of course. At that point, we just have nodes. So, so if you're confused by this, keep in mind that there's a new notation for doing indexed uh, aggregate fields. And it's, of course, particularly useful for tuples because those don't have meaningful names. Uh, they actually, well, and they will have eventually, potentially, but um, so let's see, memcomp int buff, and then of course, hang on. You can only access fields on aggregates or pointers to aggregates. Oh, of course. So this should, we need to tell it what it is. Um, this thing, we should give it the hash. Man, it's almost like the compiler, when when the compiler isn't completely brain dead like MSVC, where it tells you about all the wrong errors that are sort of like fifth order consequences of the first order issue, that you can just fix stuff. It's almost like you have to go out of your way to make a bad compiler. Um, I guess this is not getting executed. Do I not have the right startup project? Yeah, I do. That's very odd. Did I turn off? I did. I was I was debugging the compiler generator, and so I sometimes need to turn off the line syncing so I can see what C code actually generates the compilers. Okay, so let's see here. So we were passing in the string pair, and this should have length three. And so we start by hashing this mofo, um, and then we do this lookup, and it says zero, which is uh, there, which means there's you know it's the length. Um, so we make this buffer. Um, can the compiler oh, can't do that? But anyway, um, we link in the old node, which is null. Put in the length. Copy over the buffer. So now let's. Check the buffer, indeed. <clears throat> and then we uh, insert it under its hash value and return that. So now we should, um, be able to do this and confirm that they return the same thing. So you can see now there was a hit in the hash table. And so these are the same. Let's just put that in the cert. Yep. Um, and now let's put some other tests along these lines and make sure they pass too. Okay, I think that's basically it. How are we doing on time? Uh, one minute and 45, one hour and 45.
Yeah, no, I, I'm kind of being obnoxious. I understand why it is, but MSVC's compiler errors, you have to admit, are particularly uh, egregious. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not a totally stupid person, and I kind of do know that I should never... The, the, the problem with MSVC is, first off, there's always multiple compiler errors. The worst part is they're never in the right error. They're ne never in the right order, so it's not enough to read them sequentially. You actually have to look at all the errors to see if any of them could be spurious and could be caused by another error, and then you have to go investigate the primary error. Most of the time, the problem, to be fair, the problem is I think MSVC still, by default still has a very loose KNRC interpretation of implicit function prototypes and, you know, like the idea that everything is implicitly int, which is probably the dumbest idea in C. And uh, I don't understand why that is still in, apparently in their compiler semantics. Like that should not, you should have to turn on a big red switch in order to activate that kind of behavior because that's truly antediluvian that's almost pre i guess technically it's knrc or even ANSI C, but it, i think philosophically it's even pre-knr it's primeval it's complete garbage the whole implicit it thing is stupid because it means that all these errors are you know they're it's sort of like it just makes assumptions and then it gives you errors based on those assumptions which you never gave it in the first place um all right but yeah so you can see how easy this is uh we just had to fix the compiler <laughs> is what could actually tell us what was wrong. And then we just fixed the errors and it worked. And this code is, if, if you put it side by side with uh, what we had before, I could, I could never remember how you do window splitting. Is that actually a thing? Um, I almost never use this, but maybe I should. Um, let's go and compare it to our code. It's going to be comparable, but It's a little bit nicer. I mean, we're not doing the arena dialog, but that's just a different function. Let's see how. Let's see if there's any actual differences. No, I somehow wrote the exact same code. I think. Oh, it does stir and comp. Why do I do stir and comp? I must just not have been thinking. That should clearly be mem comp. Um, and in fact, you can see that this is not really what this really is. Is not really a name map. It's a variable length buffer map. Right? It doesn't care about the fact that it's a string thing. Uh, it's only this. It's only the front end here that actually assumes it's dealing with string data. The rest of it is just byte buffer data. So maybe I should find out another name for this and, or factor out this into something else. So the way to think about this is this is a way of putting a map for variable length data on top of a map for fixed length, much, much shorter data using external chaining to resolve the extremely rare ambiguities where two things, two uh, variable length buffers happen to have the same 32-bit hash. Which again, with 32-bit hashes and a good hash function, you need on the order of 64K before you even start getting more than, you know, before you even start getting, say, one or two expected collisions. And even that, it just means that you have to do two probes rather than one, which is not much. Uh, this would be a problem once you approach you know, hundred, maybe hundreds of thousands, mil millions of uh, of nodes. Then you start seeing a few more collisions, but it goes up linearly until you start hitting four billion, basically. At which point, you know, uh, anyway, something like that. Uh, and you can make the sixty-four bit if you want it to be less space efficient. That's probably, you know, what it's not a bad idea uh, to make them be sixty-four bit because if you look at if you look at the other data that's here. We have variable length string data, so this is kind of a drop in the bucket in terms of per entry cost. So we can actually just change that because the hash function itself is 64-bit. Um, so now we get more disambiguation. All right, so I would say that's uh, mission accomplished on that end. Um, and with that, I think we can say that we did something today. Um, and I think things are turning out very nicely. Let me see, yeah. And, and I mean, but also our old hash map was a piece of crap, to be honest. There was all kinds of hacks. Like I had hard-coded sentinel values as zero. So anytime you wanted to put in something that was an actual semantic zero, you had to remap it and do all kinds of garbage. So th that was simply because we could get away with it in our limited use case. But now we handle the general case. We have a nice API. Everything is just smooth sailing. How awesome is that? All right, that's it for me today. I'll be back in two days again. Uh, I, I think I said last stream that I would try to push the compiler. I will actually focus on 
taking a chill pill and stop making compiler changes and uh, solidify it a little bit and then check it in um, so people can play around with it. I know people have been asking. Uh, I have a uh, by the way, because I'm, I've been so out of programming for the last four or five months, however it's been since I was streaming, um, I haven't ch done a single, I just realized this morning, I haven't done a single commit since I started hacking on it five days ago. So there's probably going to be like a single 8,000 line commit or something. So I apologize for that. That's, uh, I'm, t I'm a terrible person, I know. But I'm going to try to get that, review that diff today and then check it out so people can play with this stuff. All right, that's it for me. Uh, if there's any questions, I will answer it. And uh, otherwise, I will be back uh, in two days. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I, I will... Fuck, did I forget to record? No, I did record. I always am paranoid. I forgot to record. So anyway, that's it for me. I will be back next week. Um, and uh, everyone have a good time. Since, until then. <laughs>